I want to introduce everybody to Gwen Samuels. She's a media artist whose work is inspired by fashion, architecture, and design. She holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Syracuse University and has studied or completed residencies at Haystack School in Maine, the Women's Studio Workshop in New York State, Peters Valley School of Crafts in New Jersey, and the Anderson Ranch in Colorado. Gwen has exhibited her work throughout the United States in such venues as the Oceanside Museum of Art, San Luis Obispo Art Museum, uh, let's see, what else? The Kellogg University Art Gallery, San Diego Art Institute, as well as numerous art fairs such as Photo Independent and the other art fair. Her work has also been exhibited abroad in England, Italy, Germany, and South Korea. So Gwen, with that, I am going to turn it over to you. Well, that was fun to hear. <laughs> um, that was really interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, I, um, let's see, where should we begin? Okay, um, here's how we're gonna work today because I have so many things I wanna share and I wanna have an agenda. I'll begin by sharing some things I'd like you to be thinking about when you're looking at my work and, and then we can talk about it more later. I wanna show a short video, which I took yesterday in the studio so you can get a sense of the work on the wall and you can see how it interacts with the other pieces. And then lastly, I want to share what I've been doing in 2020 and 2021, because I've really been working on two new bodies of work. And then I'm hoping for lastly to do some questions. So if you do have questions, just, you know, make a note so we can stay, you know, in the agenda, unless you absolutely can't handle it. I mean, this is not school. So if you're really, you know, needing to say something, do it. So let's start then with the first part, which will be the video. But before I begin, let me just say there are two words to describe my work, transformation and freedom. And when I say freedom, I just mean the work hangs freely. I've created a new art form combining handmade and technology. I'm driven by materials and the process. And I think about the unframed work as installations. I have a background in textile design and I like to view imagery and objects in multiples. I'm interested in combining familiar materials in unexpected ways to create new visual experiences. The imagery is my photography. It's reformatted to create something new. The loose threads which you'll see throughout have movement and reference my background in text, connecting the handmade and the smooth transparency I print on that interacts with light. So I know that's a lot, it was a big mouthful, <laughs> but just keep it in mind when you're looking. Okay, I'm in my studio now, and I'm gonna go very slowly, and you're gonna get to see some of my work so that you'll have some idea of what, how things look on the wall. The series that I'm coming to right now that you can see here with all the wire is my wire tapestry series. And the pieces are larger than I used to work in 2020. So these pieces now are completely different than what I was working on before, but you will see that there are lots of circles. This piece is really interesting. It's an installation and it's all made out of bed springs. And so you can see an interesting reflection of the imagery on the wall. This is the series now that we're coming to that is what um, I was working on throughout uh, 2020. This was the first piece. This was the second piece. And here's some butterflies that I did earlier. And then here's the third piece, another installation piece. I'm going to go up a little close so you can see it. And we'll be looking at stills of these as well. This was another piece that I did. And I think it was a culmination of that series. 
And if you look really closely, you can see it's made up of a lot of different images. And then the last piece I did for that series was about tracking and the whole idea of every person that we meet is connected to another person. But I'm looking and I'm seeing that this video is getting kind of long, so I'm gonna wrap it up. These are the last two pieces, part of that earlier stuff that we saw on the other side of the wall. And these are part of my wire tapestry series. And then here's a dress that I did earlier on. And then lastly, the three-dimensional dress that's hanging in the middle of the studio. Anyway, we have a lot to look at, a lot to talk about. Enjoy. How did it come across? Could everybody see everything and hear it? Yes. Fabulous. Great. Oh, Great. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never done that before. <laughs> okay, good. That was exciting. Okay. Um, now I'm going to show you my studio and my house. Okay, so the pandemic hit, and that's my dining room table, and that's just kind of the whole setup. So when I eat, I move everything. Ah. So, um, and you can see the works in progress all around me. And I just, I wanted to remember this, this concept because who knows what's coming next for us, right? Now I'd like to show you some of the pieces close up that we just looked at. Okay, so this is one of the pieces that, that we saw in the video and that was called One of Many. And that was kind of at the very, 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 very beginning of the pandemic where I was emotionally driven to just start cutting out circles. And I just kept cutting them out and, and arranging them. And this is what I ended up with. And what I did with it was, and I'm gonna show you now a, um, a close up. Um, so you can see all the shapes were connected by one single thread going down the middle. So the circles kind of became me and this metaphor and um, the way I arranged and connected everything sort of was my emotional state at the, as the, as the um, pandemic sort of progressed. And I have to be really honest, I, I, it was all driven. I've never had an experience where something has been emotionally driven, but I just, I could not stop doing circles. And then the next piece that I did was this one. And you saw this one in the, um, in the video. And as you can see, the spaces got a little bigger. I think that was because we were really in lockdown and we were really separate and um, I was feeling it. And the circles were circles and sides of circles. And it just, it just, I couldn't stop with this idea. And it just kept growing. And I'll show you a close up of that one too, because people like to see the stitching and, and, um, and you can really see the, the imagery and the sewing and that they were just becoming circles inside circles and side circles. And then um, you saw, okay, this one was called the process of growing and the circles became larger. And, and also I will say that, um, you know, I stopped at a certain point, but I think that in the future, any one of these installations could be continued. You know, I have to be in the mood to do it, but they can be rearranged. I think they're, they're still not a hundred percent done. So I don't know what that's going to be, but this is as far as I chose to go with them at the time. And here's a close-up of that one. So you can see the circles and, and they were just, I have tons, I have about 16,000 images on my, on my computer of different, different uh, photographs that I've taken. And they were all reformatted and then printed on transparency, and then I hand stitch them together. So it's a kind of collage. Here's tracking. We saw this one also in the studio. And this one also, I got, you know, I was ready to stop, but I could have kept going with this one also because I started becoming aware of 
who I was coming in contact with and who they were in contact with and what that all means and how everybody's connected somehow, even though we're separate. So, you know, I was really thinking about the pandemic and the circles were, were me in my metaphor. And let's see, I think I have a close up of that. Yep. Okay, so you can get a sense of how it looks connected. And I just kept making all these little arms and, and adding background. And this was pretty much all of 2020. At the very beginning of the pandemic, I started making masks. That was like the first thing. I, I, I just didn't know what I could do for my friends and family. So I just, I didn't, I, I do all hand sewing. I don't use a machine. So I started learning how to make face masks from patterns online. And um, then I was with my grandchildren and I saw that I was smiling and they couldn't see me. So I said, oh my God, I have to make smiles. So, you know, it's funny how things evolve. So I made a series of embroidered lips. <laughs> and I just kept making them in crazy colors. And I was just having a great time making all these lips, sewing them onto masks. Then what happened was the series that seems the most popular are my dresses. So I took my embroidered smiles and created a little pattern with them and created this piece called lip service. So it's made up of all my smiles and it's also round. <laughs> and um, I discovered that I always have a dress somewhere as a placemaker or something. I don't know, whenever I finished a, a series, I always have some idea of a dress. So when Janine mentioned fashion, it's something I look at every day and am very interested in. So anyway, this is made up of all my smiles. So that was all of 2020. Um, I, I was, art anchored me and kept me going. Um, and I was so appreciative. It gave me something to do every day. It gave me something to think about. And, um, and I was possessed. And then something happened. I was not done with the circles, but I started doing three-dimensional work. And this is the piece that I have behind me. It's 36 by 53 by two. So it's kind of dimensional. It's all made with wire. So I made the, I made it as a sculpture first. Then I started, you know, sewing in the, the imagery in 2020, which was interesting. I couldn't even think about wire because I needed the directness of the, um, uh, of the flat work. And here I'll show you a close up. So you can see all the patterns. So you can see how, you know, um, each piece is cut out separately and stitch to the wire armature. And then there's threads going crazy everywhere. And I was also playing with the idea of positive and negative space, which I had not done earlier. Then let's see, okay, this piece came after that, different shape, more open spaces. Um, this was in 2021. So there's hardly any, there isn't any circles. So that was a big transition for me. Um, I would say I started doing that probably in February or March. So you can see the emotional was a little quieter and, and the significance, I think, of the open space. And I was comfortable with that. And also, I'm really lucky to be living in California and I'm outside. So I have a, a garden in the back and this one's thinking about nature. And I try to do gardening every day. So you can see that that was, you know, I felt like I had to do some kind of homage to that part of my sanity. And then here's a close up. Again, you can see the patterns. And I use a lot of images from architecture. I'm very, very pattern driven. And I love combining the patterns and using the different threads. So you can see close up. Some things are recognizable. These stripes are actually an escalator. So I, I do all my shooting with my phone. You know, I, I like the repetition and the patterns that I find. Now I'm working smaller. This is a more recent piece. I just finished this one. So this one is 16 by 16. I'm still working with wire. I'm still interested in the open spaces. 
and the balance. And most of the imagery is architectural, patterns on the floor, patterns on the walls, patterns, there's actually a roof pattern. Um, so I'm always looking at everything and anything. And here is a close up. So you can see this bottom right is, is actually a roof, a tiled roof with, uh, with skylights, which takes a completely different perspective when it's, you know, next to all these other patterns. So again, with the open space and you can see the stitching and I'm still doing that, I'm still combining the stitches. And then I'll show you the piece I'm working on right now, which is color and different from the others. I don't know, I'm having different problems. <laughs> So I'm mixing and matching and, you know, trying to stay open and trying to have a narrative and trying to tell a story. It's got a ways to go. We'll see where it, where it ends up. I'll show you a close up on it as well. So you can see, in fact, this bottom green yeah. piece is um, the gardens at the Getty that at a period that there's a certain period of time where they just become abstract shapes. You can see the blue or stacks of books. So, you know, they take on a different story when you're close up. And then when you step back, I find that it just supports the object. The yellow is uh, a tile pattern that I saw at the Getty. So I never know what I'm going to see. I just keep shooting and collecting images. Oh, I also want to mention one last thing, because artists are always uncomfortable mentioning that. And I think it's really important. The work is all for sale. My prices range from the small works of 1200 to 1800 and the larger works go from 2000 to 5000 So I just think it's really important to give people a, a context of, of what the work, you know, goes for. And I guess I'm going to open it up to you guys now. Does anyone have any questions or anything they want to look at again? Or uh, you, Did you mention the butterflies? It was very curious as to what the material was. Was it acetate or how did you uh, make those butterflies? Okay, the butterflies are made the exact same way that, you know, these wire pieces are made. Um, I create a a, a butterfly shape with the wire. And the imagery is a transparency that I use. And um, I pick my patterns and I hand stitch it to the form that I create. So all the imagery is my photography. The forms, all the wire forms, you know, I make, except for when we looked at the video, there was one piece that was made with bed springs. As artists, you know, I think someone mentioned, you know, they're inspired by everything. They use everything they do. They, you know, everything is in their work. I was invited into a show years ago where uh, it was called Art from the Ashes. And we were asked to go to this big warehouse. And what they did is they supplied us with objects that were collected after a fire. And we as artists could collect what a, whatever objects spoke to us and go home and make them our own and create an art piece with them. So I had never done sculpture before. So that was when I got an antique, um, I actually got an antique fan, desk fan, and some bed springs. And I started sewing my work to other people's objects. And that's when I realized that I could start making sculpture. So it's really important to be aware because, you know, one thing leads to another, always. I mean, you know, I showed you earlier, you know, um, lip service. I mean, that came from, you know, me making smiles to sew onto my masks. So you just never know, you know, where the connections are going to be. Anyone else have any other questions? Yeah. Um, since you do all the printing, like transparencies, have you tried experimenting with lighting behind it? Oh, okay. That's a good question because people are always asking me to make them into lamps or lighting. Yeah. And, you know, it's not something that interests me, but it's really important to note that because of the transparency, it's see-through. And I'm very interested in the idea of light passing through. People have put my work on light boxes and it, it really oversaturates. So I really like the idea of hanging it on a white wall and having it well lit so that the imagery casts shadows and there's more of an interaction with the light as opposed to an oversaturation. Is that a good answer, Norm? Well, I was wondering, uh... I'm not, I didn't think of, about making lamps or something, but using light, not so much just a plain light, but 
experimenting with lights as different little particles, like lighting part of it, different parts of the, you know, the installation and stuff like that to create different, you know, lighting and sort of values to what you're doing. I don't think, I don't think that's a bad idea. I did try doing some little uh, lighting experiments. I'm not somebody who's knowledgeable about that stuff. And it took on sort of its own, you know, job. And, um, and again, the light seemed to saturate specific areas. So it didn't seem to be interesting to me, but it, it's definitely something that has potential. But at this point, I haven't done any more with it. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have any, anything else they want to add or ask or? I have a question. Uh, sure. Hi, particularly about the, um, the, uh, the work, uh, the circles that are a grid on the wall. I'm yep. wondering when you install them, like at an art show or if oh. you're very precise about the distance or is it intuitive or do you just let whoever like these? I mean, uh, how precise are you? And then also how do you attach them to the wall? I'm just also curious. Okay, both those things are great questions that I overlooked. So thank you for asking. I consider my work installation so I do very much like, especially in this piece, I would like it to be installed similarly. All the stuff weighs nothing. I use straight pins. Okay, if you look really closely on, on the circles, you might be able to see a little dot. Those are straight pins. So since they weigh nothing, what I do is I tap in these straight pins and then I pull it off the wall. So all my work looks like it's floating. Nothing is, you know, um, pushed against the wall. So mm -hmm. the other great extra, which I'm going to add now because I'm thinking about it, is the strings are hanging freely. So if you catch some wind, it moves. So that part mm -hmm. is really interesting also. But, um, you know, what I would do if someone were going to show this piece in a, you know, in a gallery or something, I would probably just make a diagram, send it to them, and then I would leave it up to them. Because, you know, I've learned when I do these shows that there's just so much, much micromanaging you can do. Then you just got to leave it up to them and let them know. One thing I'm very specific about, because I have had my work damaged, because sometimes they don't choose to read your instructions, I ask people to place the pins in the already made sewing holes because I have had them go directly into the plastic and made damaged holes. So um, they're all hung with straight pins. I don't know. Did I answer everything? Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. It's, it's really important, you know, when you leave it up to somebody else, when you send work that you just, there's a point at which you got to let it go, man. You know, yeah. and there's just so much we can do, you know? I mean, the piece behind me is pretty easy to hang and it weighs nothing. It's just cumbersome and it's large. And I use push pins with that. If I really want to pretend I'm really, really, really caring, I might send a few picture hanging hooks, but it, it doesn't, there's so much going on, no one notices. So, and it weighs nothing. So, I mean, my most heavy pieces might weigh a pound or two. So Gwen, when you print on the acetate, yep. if it gets wet, will your inks uh, blur or how do you fix it on the, on the That's acetate? That's a really good question, Janine. Because, <laughs> okay, well, let me just say, I, I came up with this idea and I had no one suggest things to me. So I do print with inkjet and the transparency that I use has a tooth on one side. So it's a, a little bit rough. And I mean, there it's such quality material though, that you really have to, you know, go like that with your hands to really feel the difference. Um, and because I print with inkjet, I discovered, and this is one bad toxic thing about my work. I spray my work with a fixative to that side. And what I have found is because with inkjet, if it gets wet, it wipes right off, no matter if there's a tooth or not. But once it's sprayed with fixative, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. I wouldn't put it out in the rain, you know? 
I mean, you know, the other thing is, you know, it's an art piece, treat it like an art piece, but it definitely, you know, I have in the beginning when I was learning how to do these things, and I've been doing this for about 10 years, you know, in the beginning, I was trying to figure it out and nobody could recommend any way to keep the imagery fixed on the, because it's non-porous, you know, there's no way that it absorbs because it's plastic. So that's a really good question. And, and it was something that I had to work out. Have you tried printing like on a, or how? having it printed on plexiglass and using plexiglass as kind of your substrate? I have not. I do everything myself and okay. it definitely would be possible and it would cost more and I don't know how the cutouts would work and I'm not saying it can't be done. You know, the same with the lighting. These are all things that definitely could be done. It's just, I really like the idea of doing it all in my house, in my own shop and my mm -hmm. Canon $100 printer. So I just, <laughs> like, you know, I like doing everything myself. So so I'm not saying those, you know, I mean, the hand sewing is absurd. It, it takes time, but it's- you have a problem with fading with the- no, um, well, I'll tell you something. I don't, I, I really haven't because we have the greatest technology at the moment. Um, but I will tell you, I have a friend who bought one of my pieces that has it directly in the sun on the sky, you know, in the window and it's fading, but- hmm. You would not treat an art piece like that. Um, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years and everything looks exactly the same. I will tell you though, in the beginning, when I first started doing this, I used a Xerox machine and the inks were not stable like they are now. So I have early pieces from the Xerox machine where the, because, you know, you photographers, it's going to cyan and, it, you know, it's, it's, it's going to different faded colors. And because it's childhood images, it's not bad with the piece, but it's definitely fading. We have the best technology at the moment. So, you know, it's archival. So I'm not concerned about it. As long as you treat it the way it deserves to be treated as an art piece, I've never had a problem, but it's a good question. I worry all the time about it. What, what about using a toner, using a laser printer with toner? Is, have you tried that? Is it any different? I don't like the color as much and I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I love my Canon printer. I had an Epson and it was so temperamental. I had one of those giant ones that was in the shop more than it was out of the shop. You know, I'm just lazy and cheap. You know, I have <laughs> something that works well and you know, I'm not, I'll get a new printer for a hundred dollars. Yeah, so, I was just wondering if, if the laser printer was more permanent on the acetate. I can't answer that. I don't know. It's a very good question. I just didn't like the colors with laser printers the inks now that they make are archival so they really yeah so i mean it's just amazing and there's a big difference from when i was using a xerox machine but that was the beginning i you know i didn't know anything and it didn't exist any other questions anything else any suggestions anything you want to see again i have well, another question wait a minute uh -huh. no it's also because um I think one of your later 2021 pieces, you said something about uh, working out a narrative. And I'm wondering if you think of your work as, you know, abstract more than narrative or how do you feel about it? And do you feel like you're trying to make a narrative out of it or is that a direction you're going in? That's a really, you know, I kind of feel like one of the things that I think about when I'm doing these things is maps. So I kind of think like there is something, you know, a mapping going on. So I'm really not sure. Sure. I mean, I can look at a piece and I can think about that idea. I'm not sure yet. You know, it's a word I'm starting to use and I'm not sure. I know this past year, um, the 2020 was was so emotionally driven for me. And I started to question the symbolism of the shapes and how they connected and if there was some story there. And it's amazing how sometimes if we give over to those kinds of things, they kind of show up. So, you know, after comparing all the pieces, I was able to see what was happening and how is it changing. And I would say these pieces are, are pattern driven just because, you know, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, Anasui, the African artist, um, oh. but I, I'm possessed by his work and his use of materials. And I was thinking about that when I did this, it was really, really, really about materials. I really do think a lot about materials, but I was thinking about nature in this one. So, and I was thinking about how the the open spaces and how everything was opening up. 
So I guess I can I can make a story if I really look at it. And I think that we all should be doing that. I think, you know, when we do things, you know, there is a story to be told. And people like to hear it. Anybody else? You had a dress hanging in the middle of the studio. Yeah. Have you thought about hanging your pieces like in the middle so you can see both sides? Or is it just something that's only against the wall? Thank you for that. Um, that Okay, that piece, I've been working with this cur curator for years since I moved to LA, which is like 20 years ago. And she put me in a show in 2019 called Dress Rehearsal, and it was all dresses. So anyway, that piece that was hanging in the middle, I have never made, no, I've made two pieces in the round um, one when my daughter got married, I made a wedding dress. And that piece that's hanging in the middle um, was another in the round piece. And I have never done in the round again, because if you can look at this piece, you can really see the white wall mm -hmm. activates and stabilizes all the colors. Because it's transparency, it's not as strong when it doesn't have the white behind it. So, you know, and I've had people actually even say, can I put it in a colored wall? And I say, if that feels good to you, I'm fine with it. But I prefer the whiteness to, you know, activate the color. So because that piece is in the round, I have no choice. Good answer. Someone else started to ask something or say something. Oh, I was just saying, um, I loved when you showed the details mm -hmm. the, because the, your work is exquisite getting up close. And I'm sure in a gallery, you can see it. But if you do anything on Zoom, it, you know, or on a, a gallery online where people can't get up close, I think it would be wonderful to show a lot of the detailed parts of it because it's really beautiful. You know, thank you for that. I I um, I have an artist friend who kept getting you know frustrated when I would send her images when she tried. You know how we do with our phones to you know look closer and right. and, and um, sometimes that's you know not working on a website. So if you look at my website, I have these banners across every page which are closer okay. because people want to look closely, especially artists. We want to get up close. We want to see what's going on we want to see every stitch so thank you for that because it's important you know it right. and, and also the other thing um here i'm going to do this again you can see in like the you know the larger that i make it the more you can start to see like like this is just a patch of interesting grass right that, you know that i liked but you know when it when it's you know smaller it doesn't, you know, it just reads and supports the object. But when you can go in close, right. you think, oh my God, those are steps. Oh my <laughs> God, that's an escalator. You know, and I think that part's really important. How large is Thank the piece? You. Did someone else want to say something? Yeah, I was asking how large the piece is. Okay, which one? The one we're looking at on white. The one we're yeah. looking at right now is um, thinking about nature. It's 36 by 24. And then... Um, it's off the wall slightly because it's dimensional. You can't really see that when you look at the piece, but because it's very irregular because it's um, wire mm -hmm. and there's different, you know, when you're sewing, the areas that are sewn are tighter and have more of a tension than the open areas. So I usually put uh, two inches. So um, again, it's uh, 36 by 24 by two, but it really helps to see it next to that other one, which I showed in the studio situation, because you, you need it in relation to something else to really get a sense of, you know, what that's like, or you can get out a ruler and go, oh, I know 36 inches, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when it's next to the, to the one that was 36 by 53, you can start to see, it's not little, but it's, you know, not, not as big as the 53 inch. Um, anything else? When it looks like um, some of the galleries and things are opening up in LA, do you have any shows that are coming up? I wish that would be very nice. I would love to have a show, but I don't have anything. It's been a, it's been such a strange year. And um, in fact, I haven't, I have my first appointment at the hammer next month okay. for the biennial because, you know, they're doing, um, you know, they're, they're, you can only have X amount of people in the room. Okay. Mm -hmm. So no, I don't. Um, it's been a very, 
unfortunately, quiet year. And um, did, you, did you participate in any of the other art fairs online virtually? Um, I, I did not. I wanted to do, and I recommend this to artists, is the other art fair through Saatchi. Mm -hmm. I had such a great experience with them. And they do an amazing, uh, well, they're doing in person. They've got a Brooklyn show coming up, but they do such good stuff and it's a fun show to participate in. So if anyone is thinking about it and they give you great support. So I really recommend Saatchi and the other art fair. Um, I did that twice, a couple before the pandemic. And Gwen, um, do you want to talk a little bit about um, maybe studio visits? And you were saying before everybody came on that the, the studio where you are currently um, has been putting you in touch with different people and how that whole process goes. Oh, it's so fantastic. Okay, um, this is, uh, well, Janine, I know Janine through Santa Monica Art Studios, which was taken over by a group called 18th Street. Um, and they are a nonprofit and they have a philosophy. And if you have a moment, you should look at their website. It's really interesting. They have a philosophy and they do a lot of residencies. And by the way, they do placements all over the world, which is amazing. And they are always having residencies there, which is also really cool. Anyway, so um, they, they connect through their organization with gallery owners, curators. I had an experience with a writer, which was really cool, that writes for art magazines. And, um, you know, just the opportunity to talk about your work with someone and hear their feedback and also the ideas that they come with. This last one I had was with a woman... Uh, um, Michelle Guerlain, she's a feminist and she's very, uh, her background was, you know, the, like I have a background in my work. She had a Kusama in, infinity image behind and she's very into female art. And it was really cool just to have a conversation about your art with um, someone who's out and about in the art world. So um, I love these studio visits on Zoom. I look forward to physical vi visits though, because stuff happens, you know, stuff happens in the studio that doesn't happen on, on a computer. So, you mm -hmm. know, um, and I, you know, they're always setting up things. Um, is everybody here part of your artist collective? Yeah, so the West, the artist collective of Westport is about 150 artists from- what? from the Fairfield County area and some live in New York actually and have like a second home or something in Connecticut but um yeah so everybody in this group are, are from the collective oh so that's great so are these opportunities available do you have these kinds of things or people need to organize it themselves I, we pretty much have to organize it ourselves yeah. I don't know does anybody else have any any thoughts on that yeah it's a <laughs> No, no. Uh, you know, we had that before at Santa Monica Art Studios, you know. So this is a real organization that's moving and shaking. We get twice, we get twice a week, we get what's going on and what shows they're curating and what opportunities. It's, it's amazing. It's really amazing. And I, I don't know how and and you have the choice to take advantage or not. Yeah, that's great. You know, some people are in it all the time. Like today I sent off another, you know, I want to meet with one of these people that is available. Um, and then other people are just there to do their work. So, you know, that's the other part as, as you remember we had. Yeah. You know, people, some people want to be out and about in the world and some people just want to do their work. Yeah, that's true. You know? Does, does anybody have any other questions for Gwen? No? Well, Gwen, thank you so much for joining us and it was good to see you on the screen. It's it was fun and, 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 you know, thank you for this opportunity. It was fun. And, you know, if you think of something, please feel free to email me. Um, and thanks. It was good. <laughs>